I hope people are, are still uh, enjoying Genesis and benefiting from it a little bit. And we've had uh, several months learning from the, the sort of prehistory section of the book of Genesis leading up to the call of Abraham. So my plan is to finish Genesis at the point where we meet that man, Abraham, Abraham, and then to take a break and go back and look at the story of Abraham later this year, but having had a little bit of a rest from the book of Genesis to look at something else. So we'll get a bit of texture in our Sunday morning diet, something a bit different. Uh, we know that the book of uh, Genesis and the first five books of the Bible are attributed to Moses, that he was probably the, the main author. He may have had sources, there are clues, even in these chapters we've just read, that there were some written records going back to the time of Adam that were available to Moses. Uh, and family records and clan records would be committed to memory as well. Uh, so uh, this book didn't just come out of nothing, but Moses was carried by the Holy Spirit and inspired to write these opening books of the Bible. And these books show us our origin, where we've come from. They show us our purpose, and they make sense of a world where there is pain as well as pleasure. These books make sense of a world that is glorious and beautiful and amazing, a world that takes your breath away, but also a world that breaks your heart. I don't know if you were to tune into the news over the last few days. You might have seen reports um, from the deep oceans of the effects of human pollution on coral, on a plant and animal and fish life in the oceans. And you'd see beauty, astonishing beauty, but you'd also see the damage that we've caused to our environment. You might have heard this, the news reports about the 75th anniversary of the Great Escape, and that would bring back memories of the Second World War and of mass murders and of terrible injustice. In touching distance, there are people alive still who remember these events, their fathers, their brothers, their uncles, who were caught up in these events. It's not so long ago, and yet it is about to fade into history. This world is amazing, and this world is not the way it's supposed to be. Genesis explains that, makes sense of it. Where we come today, I didn't get John to read the whole of chapter 10 with its lists of clans, of tribes, of their languages, and of the places where they stayed, just to give you a flavor of it. But I did get John to read the first nine verses of Genesis 11. And the purpose of this section in Genesis, it's the fourth of the, here is the history of, here is the account of, here is the Toledoth of. And it gives you the account of where the sons of Noah went. And they went everywhere, and they filled and populated the earth. So two lessons, really, that we can learn today, and uh, I hope we'll do justice to what the Spirit of God is saying in Genesis 10 and the first part of Genesis 11 in this fourth block of the ten blocks that make up the book of Genesis. The two things to learn are, first of all, about God and the nations. These chapters tell us that God is not just interested in one nation. He's interested in all nations. Not just one people group or language or ethnicity, but all peoples and languages and cultures, God and the nations. And the second thing we'll explore is that God is concerned about our deadly pride. And the story of the tables of the nations in chapter 10, and the story of how the nations came to be scattered across the earth in chapter 11 are 
about these two things, God and the nations, and God and our deadly pride. So, dealing with the first thing, God and the nations. I've said a little about the structure of the book of Genesis. Maybe it's worth saying that chronologically speaking, Genesis chapter 11 should come before chapter 10. But thematically, Moses has organized his material deliberately to tell us the outcome, the effects of the Tower of Babel in chapter 10, and then he tells us about the Tower of Babel incident itself in chapter 11. It's quite obvious that that's the case because chapter 11 begins by saying that all the peoples descended from Noah had one language, they were essentially one culture, and they were essentially in one place. But after the incident at the Tower of Babel, they're scattered, and they're all over the face of the earth, and they are diversifying into different ethnicities and different uh, cultures and different languages as well. These nations, uh, where they end up at the time Moses is writing, that's what's set out in chapter 10. The world, as the readers of Genesis knew it, is being set out in chapter 10. How the world got there is being set out in chapter 10. 11. There's a particular mention of a man called Eber, and he's interesting because he is in the line of Shem, and he is essentially the father of the Hebrew people. So, he's mentioned um, in the uh, section that we've just had read to us, and he leads us to the story of Abraham. So, we, we have a flow and we have a structure. The way to think about this is to imagine that you, if you were living in the ancient world and you had this book read out aloud to you, either you could open a map of the world and follow with your finger all the places mentioned in chapter 10 and sort of sweep around the whole known world and say, oh, that's where those tribes are. That's where those tribes are. There, there's where that language is. It's like a visual guide to the world. We think of the world, we're living in the age of satellites, and we, we think of the whole globe as if it was viewed from space. And we've seen globes, and, and even centuries ago, people, cartographers, would draw maps that would show continents and oceans and the globe as best they could visualize it. They wouldn't always get the proportions quite right, but they had a sense that Canada was over there, and Greenland was over there, and Europe was over here, and Africa was down there. And they, they sort of had it right. They had that view of the globe. Britain at the center, or if you've got an American map, the United States at the center, that, because that's the way we tend to view the world. We, we view the world through a particular lens. And the center in Genesis 10 is where the Hebrew people lived. They're not really mentioned. Canaan is mentioned, Eber is mentioned, but there's no particular talk about the Israelites, the 12 tribes. That's just assumed. But the center of gravity around which chapter 10 tells the story of the nations is looking out from Israel to where the descendants of Ham and Shem and Japheth ended up. And if you knew the geography of the ancient world from the time of Moses, it would be immediately obvious to you that you were standing somewhere in the Holy Land doing a 360 around the whole world and saying, there's where the people of Shem went, there's where the people of Japheth went, there's where the people of, of um, Shem, Ham, Japheth, uh, the three of them. Their descendants are everywhere and their languages are everywhere, and their cultures 
are everywhere. This would really be interesting if you lived in that time of Moses and if you were so aware that Egypt was dangerous, that there were dangers in Arabia, that there were dangers to the north, to the east, to the south, all around the world, that there were false gods being served and worshipped by these different peoples, and that you were somehow related to all these people, even those who've oppressed you, even those who are enemies. So, Genesis 10, there's a visual guide to the nations, and it talks about linguistics, and it talks about politics, and it talks about geography, where the clans are, what their languages were, what their nations and lands were. If you add them all up, most scholars are agreed that Genesis 10 tells you about 70 nations. Now, is that significant? Well, I've told you often that numbers are a big deal in Genesis, and that especially multiples of 10 and multiples of 7. So 70 is a multiple of 10 and 7. 70 nations mentioned in Genesis 10 is, is another poetic way of saying, here's the whole world. Here is totality. Here's the united nations of planet Earth. Here's everyone. And we are one blood. And we are one in Adam and one in Noah. Everybody is made in the image of God. It makes racism ridiculous. It makes despising and looking down on other cultures ridiculous. Because we are of one blood. Every human life is precious and valuable. And despising one group because of their color or their language or something to do with how much wealth they have or how much education they have is contrary to the plain reading and teaching of the Word of God. We are one blood. Now, we can read the Bible and miss that because arrogance and pride and love of our nation and our culture is seemingly hardwired into us in a fallen world. We love to define ourselves against other people. And they're the bad people and we're the good people. But when you learn a little bit about history, you discover that a little over a hundred years ago, there was no country called Germany. It didn't exist. Now the peoples, they were there. And the languages, they were there. But that nation is an invention. And it's been reinvented a few times. And you can do the same. You maybe have to go back a wee bit further, a few hundred years more. But you can do the same with Great Britain and with the British Isles. It hasn't been there forever. And it may not be there forever. These ideas of nation and state and flag, we've got to be really careful with them because the Bible is more interested in stressing that we are one blood, that we are one race, and that everyone is important in the eyes of God. And that God is interested in the end and the welfare of the whole earth. And the reason he chooses Eber and the family of Shem, and the reason he chooses Abraham at the end of chapter 11 and into chapter 12 and onwards is so that Abraham and his descendants and the nation of Israel will be the light for the nations. The 70 nations are never forgotten by God when he puts a special blessing on the one nation. All the families are in the promise when God makes a promise with Abraham. So what's the big picture in Genesis 10? God cares about the world. He cares about the nations. Now, I've mentioned the 70 nations that are listed in Genesis 10. It's just a little thing, and maybe I'm making too much of it. But let me suggest that you have a glance sometime at Luke's gospel 
and a very interesting thing that Luke does in his gospel in the ministry of Jesus when Jesus in Luke chapter 10 wants to send missionaries out to the whole of the nation of Israel. How many did he send? He sent 70, two by two, to go to every town and every village. And it looks as if although Jesus focused his ministry on the Israelites, on the people of Israel, even in choosing 70 missionaries to go to Israel, it seems to me that it is implied that the reason Israel gets the gospel from Jesus is to hear that glorious word, the Lord is near, the kingdom of heaven is among you, and therefore the 70 go out two by two to make Israel a missionary nation to the nations. The 70 brings you back to the Old Testament, and it makes you think, not just of the narrow beam focus that God has an interest in Abraham and the Israelites, but that God has a wide beam interest in the whole world and in all the nations. So Jesus sent out 70, and there are 70 ethnicities and languages at the beginning of the Bible. I think we can join the dots and make something of that. God and the nations. But also, we need to think about the Tower of Babel incident, which occupies chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. What's that about? I think it's about pride. It's about arrogance. It's about humans against God. It's about humans shaking their little fists at God and saying, we're going to run this world. So the second thing is God and our deadly pride. How do we get from the three sons of Noah with a unified culture and a unified language to at least 70 nations in a huge diversity of locations, huge diversity of languages, huge diversity of cultures? How do we get there? The answer Genesis gives in chapter 11 is God coming down onto the earth and judging and scattering humanity and making them spread because they weren't going to spread on their own. The title I gave to today's sermon is a skyscraper named Pride. If you think of skyscrapers, you think of the history of great cities like New York. You think of the uh, Manhattan uh, skyline, you think of cities like London or Beijing or Shanghai, you think of uh, cities like Kuala Lumpur where tall, tall buildings rise up to the heavens, where wealth is concentrated, where bankers and businessmen and people in fancy offices and fancy hotels uh, have all the power and all the influence in the world. Skyscrapers. In the ancient world, the big buildings, the tall buildings, the central buildings that a city was built around were usually designed for worship. They were temples. Not just palaces, but a palace for God or the gods. And the idea was in the ancient Near East, in Mesopotamia, in Babylonia, that they built temples with steps up the side, a bit like a pyramid you could walk up. They called them ziggurats. And they might have a garden on top, a bit like the Garden of Eden. Or they might be painted blue at the top to represent the heavens and the sky. But the idea was that the royals and the priests could go up there and commune with the heavenly beings. It was a human attempt to get closer and closer to heaven and to represent heaven and to control heaven by saying, look at what our power can do. We can build a vast structure with bricks 
and we can reach up to the sky. Now, we live in the age of satellites and of humans traveling out into the solar system to the moon and maybe beyond. And so the tallest of tall buildings on the earth isn't that impressive to us. But to ancient peoples living thousands of years ago, a really tall building, it gave you a sense of achievement. We've come together and we've done something amazing. We built this tall structure in the plain of Shinar where Babylon would be. We humans have decided to stop spreading out across the face of the earth and just to build. Why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because it's human pride refusing to listen to God. It's human pride being deaf to God's word because in the book of Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, in the book of Genesis, in the story of Noah as well, go back to chapter 9, God said to humans, fill the earth, go everywhere, subdue the earth, and bring glory to God by having human beings live everywhere. Fill the earth with human beings. Fill the earth with human civilization. Fill the earth with human culture. And fill with the earth with things that bring praise to God. But in the plain of shine, our human beings said, let's stop here and build a city. You know that Cain, the first murderer, what he did was to build a city and name it after one of his sons to make a great name for himself and his own family. City building in the book of Genesis is a refuge from God. City building is saying to God, you said spread, we say no. You said go everywhere, we say let's go up. Let's build a skyscraper. It's disobedient. It's deaf to God. It's arrogant. It's proud. And again and again, the city is a place where you can be anonymous, you can hide your sins, you can go away from God's plan, you can do whatever you like, and you can club together in large enough numbers as humans to try and push God away. I'm not so sure that modern cities are so very different from ancient cities in that regard. What does human pride do then in the story of the Tower of Babel in chapter 11? Well, it seems to me that pride, human pride, is replacing God and the praise of God with human praise, human self-worship, human self-glory, and looking for security and peace from what human hands can build, replacing God with human praise and with human security. The key verse is verse 4. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. There are four problems with this. Problem number one, they aim to build a city. God had not told them to do that. Problem number two, they aim to build a tower in that city that will reach to the heavens. And that's an expression of their pride and their arrogance. God had not told them to do that. Problem number three, they aim to make a name for themselves. That is the key problem in it all. They are interested, like Cain, in self-praise and self-glory. And problem number four, they don't want to be dispersed over the face of the whole earth, but God told them to go everywhere. You see how verse four is telling you, God has a plan to do this, and humans are doing the opposite of what God wants. That's why through the rest of the Bible, Babel and Babylon becomes a brooding presence and a threatening presence. It is a way of describing the anti-God culture, the anti-God world. The great power in the time when the New Testament was being written 
was not Babylon, but Rome. And yet, when the apostle Peter wants to talk about the evil Roman empire and the evil Roman emperors, he will call them Babylon. The end of the first letter of Peter, he he mentions somebody in his correspondence, and, and he says, probably meaning the church in Rome, she who is in Babylon sends you greetings. Babylon is the world against God. Babylon is the world shaking its little fist at God and wanting self-glory. But self-glory is self-defeating. Have you ever seen something of our celebrity culture where somebody wants fame and glory, but actually it backfires spectacularly? And people see through it, and they just see, this is fake, this is sham, this is insincere. I think if you use social media, you should be very careful about it. And you should pray to the Lord about it, that you will not use it in a proud or a boastful way that is all about you and your greatness and your glory, because that's a great temptation for the human heart. Even those who are engaged in some form of Christian service or Christian ministry, it can be very easy to describe it and talk about it and say, here's my prayer request. But actually what it is, is look at me. Aren't I amazing? Aren't I great? Aren't you lucky to know me? Now, I have to guard against that. Maybe you have to guard against that. I think we all have to guard against that. We have to be murder us with our pride. Because if we're not murderous with our pride, Babylon will get us, and we'll build a tower, and we'll think we're going to reach the heavens, and you know what? God pushes those towers over. When you're a little child, you get great fun from building a tower and knocking it down. But it's a really silly way for an adult to build their lives. I'm going to build my tower for my glory. Well, because God loves you, he'll push it down. Because God doesn't want you glorying in yourself and your achievements. God wants you glorying in Christ and relying on him. And it's a terrible thing when God abandons a culture to believe its own propaganda about itself and to believe in its own greatness. That is a form of judgment. I want a name, says the builder of Babel. I want fame. I want to show that we humans can do anything. And God says, I'll scatter you. The structure of chapter 11 gets Bible scholars really excited. I talked about ziggurats a wee while ago. A ziggurat is a step, 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 step up to the top platform where heaven and earth meet, like a pyramid but with steps. If you take the first nine verses of the book of Genesis chapter 11 and look at them, you get a balance around verse 5. Everything around the first clause of verse 5, verse 1 and verse 9 kind of echoes itself. And you get that step structure all the way through of a carefully balanced passage. And you could diagram it a bit like building a temple or a ziggurat or a city tower up to the top point, which is verse 5. So at the beginning, you have everybody speaking one language. And at the end, God has scattered them so that they're no longer speaking one language. You've got phrases that recur in verse 2 and verse 8 there or from there. In verse 3 and verse 7, the people speak, but then at the end, God speaks. Come, let us, say the people. Come, let us, says God. In verse 4 and at the end of verse 5, the people say, let's build for ourselves. And God, in uh, the corresponding step down, says, look at what mankind has built. There's a city and a tower mentioned in verse 4, and there's a city and a tower mentioned at the end of verse 5. And it all gathers around the pivot, the the high point of the ziggurat, if you like, the pinnacle, the center of verses 1 to 9, which is the words at the beginning of verse 5. 
This is where your eye is supposed to fall as you listen to the text of Genesis 11, 1 to 9. And what does verse 5 say? Man in his pride is building a, building a tower to reach the heavens. But verse 5 begins, But the Lord came down. Man couldn't build a tower to God. God had to come down to have a look at it and inspect it and push it over and push over the culture that was trying to live without God. The center of this passage is its focus on God and on God coming down with a very particular purpose to make us choose what city are we going to belong to? The city of Babylon, the city of mankind, the city of earth, or the city of God? Choose your city. There's, there's satire in it. Let's build a city to reach the heavens, and God has to come down to have a look at it because it's so pathetic and so puny and so tiny. You know, the opposite of the pride of Babylon, the opposite of the pride of Babel, is to praise God and praise Jesus. Tim Keller says in one of his books that human pride and lust for power leads to racial and national division, strife and hatred. If you like, the problem of the Tower of Babel is caused by our pride. But the gospel is the answer. Our call to worship today came from 1 Peter, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, Paul, Peter tells us there that if you're a Christian, you belong to a new ethnicity. You are a new ethnic. You are a new nation. Your fundamental identity, if you're a Christian, is not I am Polish, not I am Indian, not I am Slovakian, not I am Irish, not I am Scottish. Your fundamental identity is not that you are European or white Anglo-Saxon or West African or whatever identity seems to be important to you. Your fundamental identity is not that you're middle class or working class. Your fundamental identity is not that you identify as one of the, the new genders. Your fundamental identity is not that you are straight or that you are gay. Your fundamental identity, says Peter in 1 Peter 2, 9, is if you're a Christian, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. That's your identity. You are the new ethnicity. You are the new people group in Christ. You are called to be a holy people, a different people. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, your identity was something else. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now there's a problem. If my fundamental identity is something to do with me or my humanness or my culture or my education or how much property I own or whatever I'm worth, that's going to fall apart. If my fundamental identity is nationalistic or whatever, it'll fall apart. God wants us to run from the city of Babel into the new Jerusalem, into the arms of God. God wants our heart to belong to God so that the fundamental truth about us is that we're building a city with God, the city of worship, the city of compassion, the city of Christian fellowship. Choose your city because architecture matters. The first skyscraper in Babel was a temple to human pride and quite literally people will build things in their lives to show that they're still worshiping things. The question for us is are we going to go with the Babylon culture that says you trust yourself 
Or are we going to go with the new Jerusalem culture that says, you belong to Jesus and his holy nation? I'll finish with a quote from G.K. Chesterton that might get you thinking. You might discuss it in the home groups on Wednesday. See, we find it very hard to go against our culture. Babylon is strong. But if you're alive in Christ, you can go against your culture. You can go against the values that seemingly have captured the hearts of men and women. Chesterton said this in in a work called The Everlasting Man. He said, a dead thing can go with the stream. Dead fish, it goes down, down the river. But only a living thing can go against the stream. A living fish can swim upstream against the pressure of the water. Our culture says to us all the time, God doesn't matter, forgiveness doesn't matter, love doesn't matter, kindness doesn't matter, worship doesn't matter. All that matters is wealth or power or sex or whatever the culture is particularly into at the moment. Human autonomy, human freedom but we can swim against that culture. We can leave Babylon and find our way to the city of God when we embrace Jesus Christ. So, God wants us to choose our city. Is it the city of this world that is proud? Or is it the city that is to come, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven? Choose your city wisely. Lord, we thank you for Genesis and for the book of beginnings and for the wisdom that it contains. May we learn much from it. And as we think and meditate this week, may we be able to apply these things to the way we uh, walk away from arrogance and pride, walk away from racism and cruelty, and embrace your kingdom and the rule of Jesus Christ. We ask it for his sake. Amen.